you've delegitimized the Israelis to the point that like their lives don't matter. It's disgusting. It's, it's unfathomable that we have come to this point where uh, rape and murders and massacres don't matter because they're Jewish. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. We're continuing our JNS coverage of the war on Israel that was launched by Hamas on October 7th and the surge in anti-Semitism in the United States by speaking with journalist Stella Escobedo about the biased coverage of the conflict. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. There is a daily Top Story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can see us on Telegram. You can find the latest news, including Top Story, and other JNS TV content there by subscribing. And now to today's program. It's been 100 days since October 7th, and the fallout from the Hamas pogroms has seemingly changed the landscape of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, as well as the state of world Jewry. The main response of the international community to Hamas's decision to launch a new war against Israel with the mass murder of Jews, torture, rape, and kidnapping is to blame Israel for responding in its defense. The campaign to eliminate Hamas and thereby make future such attacks of aggression and terrorism impossible has been to declare that that goal is invalid and that, at best, the only legitimate way for Israel to fight this war in defense of its people is to allow the Islamist group's use of human shields to make them invulnerable to any counterattack. Whereas attacks on Jews, whether the October 7th pogroms or the tens of thousands of rockets and missiles filed, fired at Israeli civilians are treated as legitimate acts of resistance, any attacks on Hamas targets, whether or not they are located in schools, hospitals, or civilian neighborhoods, are treated as genocide. Israel's efforts to eliminate the terrorists are treated as disproportionate, as if proportionality has ever been required of its enemies when it seeks to kill Jews. But the double standards and lies that make up the indictments of Israel in kangaroo courts like the one at the International Court of Justice are only made possible by the way the international media, as well as the corporate media in the United States, have reported and commented about this. I've spoken repeatedly about the way that woke ideology has influenced a generation of Americans to wrongly view the Palestinian war on Israel's existence as analogous to the struggle for civil rights in the United States and to falsely identify the Jewish state and Jews as white oppressors. The toxic myths of intersectionality and critical race theory are at the root of a lot of what is wrong with the mainstream media that has been indoctrinated in these ideas. But the problem of anti-Israel media bias is not solely a function of this background. It's also rooted in the willingness of journalists to ignore facts, and to slant the news to one side in a conflict, even if the side it is helping is a genocidal terrorist organization and the side it opposes is a democratic nation. When journalists trust and platform the lies of the terrorists and refuse to accept the facts provided by the democratic nation that was attacked, as has been routinely the case in coverage of the war against Hamas, the result is a mockery of honest journalism. It is also part of a willingness to always take the side of the party with less power, in this case Hamas, and to depict it as a helpless victim with no agency in its actions, while at the same time portraying the more powerful combatant, Israel, as the aggressor, even when the opposite is the case. It also involves colossal hypocrisy, as a media that has 
shown repeatedly that it is willing to take the word of virtually any female accuser in a rape case, but to deny or to, to attempt to dishonestly fact-check the testimonies of Israeli women who were the victims of rape at the hands of Palestinians. The result of this kind of journalism is that the picture of the war in Gaza that Americans have been getting from most of their media is one that is more a function of disinformation than mere bias. It is one that treats the existence of the one Jewish state on the planet and the survival of its people as something that reasonable people should be allowed to debate. And rather than inform, it has helped fuel a surge in anti-Semitism as the one message that has come through in the last 100 days it is that in the eyes of the corporate media, Jewish lies don't matter. To discuss the state of the media and how it has covered this war, I'm happy to welcome to the show a journalist who has been doing her best to oppose these lamentable trends both in her broadcast work and on social media. Stella Inger Escobedo is a news anchor on the One America News Network, an Emmy Award-winning journalist who has previously worked at ABC and CBS affiliate stations around the country, covering both politics as well as national and local news, and as well as being a passionate advocate for the Jewish community. She immigrated with her family to the United States from Uzbekistan as a child and as a graduate of the University of Southern California, and she's a wife and a mother of two girls. Stella Escobedo, welcome to Top Story. Well, hello, Jonathan. Good to see you. It's uh, it's different to be on the other side because I'm always interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for thank you for so much for, for joining us today and being on the other side. I appreciate it. Um, before we begin uh, a discussion of um, you know, media bias and sort of the coverage of the war between Israel and Hamas, I'd like you to speak a little bit about your own personal story as a Jewish immigrant to the United States and how that influenced your journey uh, as you approach the practice of journalism in your career. So I am a refugee, a Jewish refugee to the United States from former USSR from Uzbekistan. Uh, came here at the age, you know, we were six by the time we went through the refugee process, lived in Italy, uh, came to the United States at the age of seven years old. Uh, growing up, you know, um, when we first came to America, we lived in Sioux City, Iowa, then we moved to LA. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very interesting journey. But growing up, I, I always asked a lot of questions. It was one of those things where my friends actually made fun of me, like, gosh, Stella, you're like the investigator. You always want to ask everyone and everything. And, you know, they would make fun of me. They're like, you're going to be an FBI agent one day or you're going to be a CIA agent. And I was like, you know, we'll see. Anyway, and then I decided to to become a journalist. And I, I just I always wanted to be the voice for the voiceless. That was really my whole thing. I said, I want to be able to one day have a platform to where I can I can be the voice for the people who don't have a voice, which will bring us to obviously today, but never in a million years, I think I would be here today. So um, I went to USC, got my degree in broadcast journalism and started my my career in, in mainstream media. I worked in Butte, Montana, Bozeman, uh, Palm Springs, California, Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, San Diego. I was a journal, a, a reporter and an anchor. And then... Um, you know, uh, COVID happened, uh, things happened in news that I didn't like how mainstream media was handling it. And I, and, you know, I, I said, I, I think it's time for me to make a change. And I went to one America news, um, where I'm able to actually cover stories and, and, um, things that you will not see on mainstream media, things that mainstream media refuses to touch. And it was a scary decision because when you do something for so many years, you th that's your life, you're a part of it. You're like, oh my goodness, how is this going to be when I leave this, you know, main network to go and work for, you know, One America News. And then, you know, you, you, you struggle with the thought and then, you know, you think about, but what if it's the, the best decision of my life? What if it will be the best thing ever? And you know what, Jonathan, it has been the best decision of my life to be able to tell the stories that I truly believe uh, that are not being told and being the voice for the voiceless. Yeah, well, I think that's a great story. Um, you've come of age as a journalist in an era when so many people coming into the profession have, I think, been deeply influenced by sort of leftist woke ideology and ideas 
about things like critical race theory, intersectionality that have both helped skew coverage of just about everything, but also undermine the notion that the press is supposed to at least try for objectivity, as opposed to treating journalism as strictly political activism. Uh, what do you make of the state of American journalism today? And you know, you you alluded to it. You know, going to an independent source from from you know sort of the main networks. How have these Marxist myths influenced the way we think about politics, as well as policy issues, and how they're covered? I, I, it makes me sad to be honest with you, because when I was going to school. They always told us not to be biased. Don't be biased. Tell the tell. There's two sides to a story, and let the viewer decide. And then, you know, I, I went to, you know, I, I've worked in many different newsrooms, and the reason why I left is because I saw the gradual decline. I saw how, for instance, let's say, you know, Donald Trump was treated by mainstream media. It's like even when the Abraham Accords happened, and I was in the newsroom, it was like a non-story. Like I, you know, didn't really, you wouldn't really know how big the Abraham Accords were. And in a day and age where you also have TikTok that's being influenced by China that is actually trying to take us out through our younger generation, literally, when Donald Trump talked about TikTok years ago, it was like all oh, this crazy thought, like, okay, right? And then you come to today and you really see it for what it is. And I will tell you, I didn't grow up in an age where DEI was really big, but what I see happening now is DEI. Where does DEI start for these young people in these colleges, in these universities? Well, where do they take that DEI when they, let's say, want to go into journalism? They bring it into the local newsrooms. So there, it's so deeply rooted in the newsrooms now. And all of these corporate executives also abide by all these DEI initiatives. I saw it with my own eyes when, you know, the, the George Floyd riots happened and it was like, don't say riots, don't use the word riots, use the word unrest, or or they're not rioters, they're protesters. Yeah, and it's mostly like, well, peaceful. <laughs> mostly peaceful, most, mostly peaceful protesters. And, you know, I did a, a video on my social media, and it's not just that, it's different things. It's like in California, we have a huge homeless crisis. Well, they're no longer homeless people, they're unhoused. It's like, why are we changing, why are we changing language to change the narrative like call it what it is yeah i think that's very true and, and and that's you know obviously language determines how we think about things but it also frames the issues in a way that obviously it's is tilting it in one direction right so in journalism when the language is changed it goes back to the associated press the associated press is a gold standard for newsrooms and for anyone who doesn't understand how newsrooms work whether it's print or or broadcast when the Associated Press comes out with a guidelines, guidance, it's a gold standard. So you are sent an email and your bosses say, from now on, they are no longer illegal immigrants. They are migrants. They are they're, they're, uh, undocumented. Like they try to change the language. So when you start changing the language and all of the mainstream media starts using this, this language, it changes the tone and it changes the narrative of the reality. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's the way it works, and certainly the the AP style guide is now like the um, the fundamental woke document of our time. And who's um, funny? That's what I want to look into. That's been my whole thing because it has it has a board, it has it gets it gets money from funding, and I I, I would be interesting to know where is this money coming from. Um, I think one of the biggest problems. I've noted, and certainly in the coverage of foreign affairs, has been the ignorance of many journalists, both reporters and editors, of complicated topics like the Middle East. How do you think, as someone who has been in so many newsrooms, how do you think the lack of a firm grasp of the history of the last century has impacted the news coverage of the current war in the Middle East, or things, as you just referred to a moments ago, the Abraham Accords? Uh, it's tremendously how can you fully report on uh, how can you report on something that you don't fully understand or fully grasp? I think the that the take a lot of people have is oh it's the Middle East it's 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 Israel again yeah they'll get over it but this time around it was something very different. I mean we saw the massacre of innocent men, women, and children on October seventh but then on October eighth there were these protests and Israel hadn't even done anything hadn't even taken any action. People didn't even know 
where their family members were, were they burned alive or were they taken to Gaza? And yet you have these journalists who are reporting on these protests and not even asking the right questions. Well, what do you mean by from the river to the sea? What do you mean by apartheid? What do you mean by a genocide? Now, if we had journalists who understood that, they would be able to ask the right questions and then you can get deeper with these people. Because as you and I have seen, when you do start asking these people who are saying this, this horrible uh, stuff that is baseless, they don't have answers for it. They just talk about 75 years of occupation. Well, why do you go back only 75 years? Let's go back more. Why don't we go back more? Let's go back thousands of years. Let's go back 2000 years before Islam was a religion. And I, I did a video the other day where I said, where my uh, call to action was, and I hope that maybe it lands, you know, in somebody's feed who who's an executive in mainstream media. If you are covering the Israel Hamas war and you're in a newsroom, which means writers, producers, reporters, anchors, you must watch the 40 minutes of video from Hamas. Because in order to grasp what happened on that day, you need to see what Hamas did. You need to understand what the people of Israel are going through. How can we continue to say ceasefire and cover, oh my gosh, ceasefire, look at what's happening in Israel, when Hamas still has hostages? This is a terrorist organization. So why is this terrorist organization being given a voice of some legitimate uh, government, right? And so ceasefire, and then they don't cover the facts around the ceasefire. Well, did you know there have been several attempts of a ceasefire, but Hamas doesn't want a ceasefire? And do you know that Hamas continues to fire rockets into Israel with the intent of annihilating Israel? But thank goodness for the Iron Dome. Yeah, I mean these are these are the unasked questions, but they 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 frame you know the the you know the, a really a distorted narrative, and that's I guess that is the point. If you're not asking the right questions, you're getting the narrative you want: garbage in, garbage out. One hundred percent. 100%. And, 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 and maybe, maybe they're so woke, they think they're asking the right questions because they think they're nice people. And they're standing up. This is where DEI is a problem. DEI considers Israel the white oppressors and the Palestinians as, as the brown and black people. I mean, have you been to Israel? Do you know? I mean, have you seen Ethiopian Jews? Have you seen what? It's just it, it's mind boggling. And then you have all of these celebrities now jumping on board who all of a sudden look at Israel as the white oppressor. It's dangerous and it's very scary. And the media plays a big role in shaping the way we think. Yeah. Now, in broadcast journalism, pictures and video are paramount, obviously. But that means that the videos and images you choose to show when you're doing a segment about any topic, let alone one about the war on Hamas, is so crucial. How do you think the mainstream media has done in this respect when it comes to telling the story of this war with the images and the videos they've chosen to use? Well, the thing, have you followed some of Honest Reporting? You've heard of the Watchdog Group Honest Reporting. Well, we cover they've it a lot at JNS. Yes, yeah, that's I the big it. beat for us. Really, yeah. They've done a really good job at, you know, looking into and exposing the journalists that are freelancers that are then hired and the information is used by, let's say, the Associated Press or Reuters. So if you are embedded with Hamas, you're going to send images that make Israel look bad and give information that looks bad. And then that comes down to the mainstream media. So you also have to take a, these mainstream media outlets have to take a step back and say, what what are we as journalists? Who are we hiring? What what voice are we giving giving to? And obviously, there's going to be casualties in war. Israel didn't want this, right? There was a ceasefire on October 6th. Israel did not want this. There's going to be casualties. There's going to be bombings. You constantly hear indiscriminate bombings, indiscriminate bombings. Well, we know that Hamas uses people as human shields. So if they really cared about their people, they wouldn't be hiding in hospitals and schools and, and, and all of this stuff. So to answer your question, I think it's very dangerous when mainstream media is outsourcing with people who are embedded with Hamas because it creates a totally different picture. I mean, they did a report, an expose on two journalists who were with Hamas on October 7th and then did a live stream talking about like, this is the best day ever. Oh my gosh. 
If you're watching this live stream, you should go too. Oh, wow, we got this guy. He was an IDF soldier. We killed him. Wow, it was amazing. Making fun of like people running to bomb shelters. I mean, it's disgusting. Mainstream media should take a step back and say, holy cow, like what is what is happening to the state of journal journalism and why are people in Gaza being treated differently as journalism where we have journalistic standards, right? Yes, well, that's very true. And, and honestly, it goes back long before October 7th. Anybody who knows anything about the way, you know, foreign reporters operate in Israel and in, you know, Judea and Samaria and the territories or Gaza knows that all these foreign journalists are dependent, you know, because most, almost none of them speak Arabic, little, and not all of them speak Hebrew, obviously. Um, they become dependent on these so-called fixers who basically leave them around and give them the stories that their bosses, which is basically Fatah and Hamas, want. And this has been part of, you know, Middle East coverage for decades. And now it's just, I think it's reached a, a peak since October 7th. Right. It shapes the narrative and it shapes what the world sees and the world buys into it. And you're seeing like, oh, my goodness, look at what's happening in Gaza. Yet you're not seeing the fact that Egypt has a border and it's a really good one too. Uh, the, you know, the barbed wire fence. You're not seeing in mainstream media that humanitarian aid is pouring in and that that Hamas is stealing the humanitarian aid. I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. Um, I was I, I came across a post that somebody shared on social media on Instagram, and it happened to be from this Gaza reporter who has hundreds of thousands of followers. I, I, I commented on something he said. I said, well, what about I don't remember what it was. He actually responded to me and we started a conversation and I really wanted to to see where they stand. And and I and I brought up to him and I said, listen, you know, it seems like 85% of the Palestinians, you know, voted for Hamas. They're happy with Hamas. They're happy with October, you know, October 7th. And he's like, that's absolutely not true. It's only actually 5%. I said, well, that's interesting because if it was only 5%, wouldn't they be brave like the Iranians who are going out on the streets and protesting and, you know, a, a possible revolution? And he tried to, he tried to create this narrative that, it's only 5% of the population of the Palestinians that actually dislike Hamas. And I said, well, great, if that's the case, then your feed should be full of people speaking out and saying, save us from Hamas. You know, I, when October 7th happened, you saw all of these, you know, people out on the street celebrating, spitting on, on the dead bodies of the people they had just killed and taken hostage. And He's like, well, that doesn't represent the 2 million people. How many people did you see out in the streets? I'm like, correct. That doesn't represent the 2 million people. But again, your coverage doesn't make sense with what you're telling me. Because if it was only 5% of the population, don't you think more people would be speaking out and saying, what is happening to our humanitarian aid? IDF, please, please help us. Every time we see a story on means, a, 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 on social media where it shows, you know, Hamas stealing the humanitarian aid. The other side is saying it's the IDF soldiers that are shooting at people when it's Hamas really doing it. Yeah, I mean, these, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of an incredible because the same media sources who will, you know, twist themselves into pretzels to frame a story about somebody that they don't like in, in as negative a way as possible, um, whether it's, you know, Republicans in the United States or Israelis, um, get very neutral when it comes to the Palestinians, even when there are polls and all sorts of evidence that show that Hamas is enormously popular. And indeed, the reason why there hasn't been an election in the West Bank for you know 20 years is because Fatah is afraid that Hamas will win the next election, with, and they're probably right about that. And I guess that goes to, there is so much ignorance about Palestinian politics in general from journalists and a refusal to actually ask what they believe, what Hamas believes, what their goals are. And yet they, you know, that that's part of this coverage. It's an essential part of this war. Yet that never seems to come across. Doesn't. And it's really easy. All you have to do is just, you know, ask the right questions. I mean, on social media, some of these influencer jur who now become journalists and have been propped up and have 15 million followers they they never did before before the war started i've even caught them in their own lies i posted a video now that has 1 million views on almost 1 million views on instagram where this palestinian um journalist says oh this was our life before october 7th and she's out and about and i and all i did was what a nice open air prison 
<laughs> you guys say it's an oh i mean and that video went viral because people are like yeah you're right like so these are the questions that journalists should be asking if it's an open air prison why did you leave this they, they contradict themselves and all of this stuff is easily found and you bring up a good point like the standards are so different for the people in gaza now why why israelis are still suffering there are more than 130 there were 130 people still held hostage you have families who still haven't gone to their homes so they're displaced. Now, I, there are hundreds of thousands of israeli hundreds refugees of thousands. and can we talk about hezbollah you know also there's people who have left their homes there i just had a friend who visited the border there and she went to several communities and she was facetiming me she said they're empty they're emptied out because hezbollah keeps firing rockets into israel and they can't live there but like why is that not important why the, the jewish lives don't matter that they've been displaced is it because because of the iron dome well you know what the palestinians were given millions and millions of dollars gaza could been could have been the most beautiful place it's not Israel's fault that they chose to use the money to, you know, fatten their pockets, the leaders li living in Qatar, and building, building the tunnels underground, which I'm sure were not cheap. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. They, they built, you know, they've sort of built the New York sub subway system underneath Gaza. Um, and uh, they, sometimes they talk about, well, Palestinians don't have bomb shelters. Israelis have bomb shelters, and you know the answer is actually there are lots of bomb shelters in Gaza. Just they're for the bombs, not the people. Um, switching a little bit to you know from the focus on the you know, what's going on in Israel and Gaza to what's going on here in the United States, I think many American Jews are deeply shocked since October seventh by the surge in anti-Semitism and the open expression, the shameless expression of anti-Semitic. Um, uh, smears and um, you know the calls for the destruction of the one Jewish state on the planet and advocacy for terrorism against Jews wherever they live. Um, how good a job do you think the media has done in covering this surge in Jewish hatred? And what role do you think the biased coverage of Israel has contributed to it? I don't think they've done a good job at all. They cover Islamophobia. So we're going to cover Islamophobia that doesn't exist, but anti-Semitism that is right in our faces. That's what I think. I'll tell you, there was a story in, in San Diego where uh, an imam, who's a very popular imam, who, by the way, that's where two 9-11 hijackers came from his mosque. Um, he wasn't there. He came after. He's been spewing really, really bad hate uh, rhetoric, ne just, just spewing anti-Semitic rhetoric, justifying October 7th as a resistance. His wife posted a, a horrific photo with Jewish babies. It was a picture with, with cutthroat and, and a Jewish star. And people were up in arms. I personally called the local news and said, you guys, this is this is horrible. Look at what she's doing. She is the wife of an imam. Just imagine a rabbi's wife doing that or a, a, a pastor's wife doing that. It would be all over the news. Zero coverage. Nobody covered it. Yes, she, she was removed from positions at schools and whatever because there was a domino effect from it, but not one story. Now, what I promise you, I was shocked. I was like, surely they're going to cover this. But, but at that same mosque, people allegedly, I don't know if that really happened, hung up the kidnapped posters. The local news did that as a hate crime. He accused, the imam accused, Whoever did that of a hate crime, and that got coverage. Am yeah, as if co as if putting up posters of of missing people is is a hate crime. Yet she said, yet she posted the most horrific the horrific image, and that got zero coverage. And I was like, wow, it 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 really really it really shocked me. Um, the anti semitism, you know, what's interesting is, have you been following Bill Ackman? Mm -hmm. Sure. With the Harvard, it, you know, and with the, Harvard uh, the stuff, story about Harvard. Yeah. Is you have people like Bill, you know, Bill Ackman, which I appreciate what he's doing now. But you're like, you kind of created this because you donated millions and millions of dollars to DEI. And it's interesting because the man who created it has now realized, oh, look what I did. And now is on the front lines of fighting it. <laughs> yeah, well, ironies abound, certainly, in yeah. any conflict. And, you know, my, my reaction to that is welcome to the fight. Some of us have been writing and speaking about it for years. Um, some, A lot of people are late to the to the picnic. But, 
you know, better late than never. I, I think you're certainly right that there has, you know, in so much of the coverage of anti-Semitism has been a stubborn insens- insistence by many in the media and even some in the Jewish community to pair any discussion of anti-Semitism with the question of Islamophobia. But I've wondered if much of what is labeled as Islamophobia is exactly what you just mentioned, merely reporting about anti-Semitism that is sadly coming out of the Arab and Muslim communities. And you know, I guess the question is, why are so many journalists reluctant to speak honestly about this even when groups that purport to represent Arabs and Muslims, uh, like CARE, the Council on uh, American Islamic Relations, are so open about support for Hamas. Well, and that's the interesting thing. Let's talk about CARE. I mean, CARE was investigated by the FBI in 2005 for being a front for Hamas under the Obama administration. And then Obama administration told Eric Holder, they're fine, don't, don't, don't cover them. And, and the entire time, the leader, the leader of CARE is a is a well known guy who's attached to terrorism. Fast forward to now, Care has grown into this humongous organization, um, and it would be interesting to know where that funding is coming from. Where where is the funding coming from? If it was investigated by the FBI, and now you have all these Care members um, who are, are like the imams who openly spew you hatred who are openly, I've seen some investigations, have ties to terrorism. Why is CARE an organization that is so admired in the United States, especially by our administration? The Biden administration started working with CARE as soon as October 7th happened to fight anti-Semitism. So you're trying to fight anti-Semitism with Islamophobia. Meanwhile, Biden was the vice president to Obama, he should have known that they were investigated by the FBI. And then as soon as they start working with them, fast forward, the executive director of CARE comes out with this video that, you know, went viral of him of him justifying October 7th. And what happens? The the Biden administration quietly stops working with CARE. But CARE is still still exists. Yeah. Well they you know they their origins actually date back to the 1990s when it was started, as you rightly say, as a, a political front uh, for ha- fundraising for Hamas through what was uh, then called the Holy Land Foundation, which was shut down by the Treasury Department. I, I think their ability to just I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I think their ability to masquerade as a civil rights organization dates back to the post 9-11 era. And when so many in this country were desperate, and indeed even the George W. Bush administration, desperate not to, that there shouldn't be a backlash against American Muslims, and that actually created this myth of a backlash against American Muslims, which has never had any actual proof that 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 was actually so, but it became sort of a revealed truth in, in much of the media, and the ability to of care to as I say, put itself forward as a civil rights organization rather than as a terrorist front is is based in this idea that, you know, Muslims are oppressed in this country. And, you know, there's really no evidence for that. There's never been any, you know, obviously prejudice can exist under any circumstance. But I think this was part of a way to sort of get over, you know, uh, don't be angry about 9-11, you know, when it comes from Islamist terrorism. And, you know, here we are, you know, 20, you know, 22 and a half years later, and we're still covering up for it. And we're still apologizing, allowing people who support Hamas and, you know, the worst kinds of terrorism to, you know, put themselves forward as something very different. It's very scary because if you actually take a look at what's happened in Europe, if you take a look at, you know, the no-go zones in Paris, um, the things that they're allowed to do in the open like cafes where women don't go to these cafes. I'm sorry, like what country is this? And then if Americans don't wake up and realize what's happening here, they the jihad will be in the open here in the United States. And it's very, very scary. And, and it's very scary that CARE gets to operate with kind of like immunity. They have lawyers, they have all this stuff and they threaten people. I know people who have, you know, done stories on them and 
they've gotten lawyers and, and, and don't worry, you know, it's basically one of those things. It's like, don't worry, we'll take care of you. I mean, I mean, look at what happened yesterday where you had these free Palestine um, uh, people from, is it WOL, the, the leader of WOL, Nardine Kwasami or whatever her name is. They're protesting in front of a, a, a cancer center. Like, like who, yeah, who the is the Sloan like, Kettering uh, hospital in New right. York? Right. And you think, and I just took a step back and I'm thinking, they have to be a lot of a lot of their support does come from care. They have lawyers. They have you know all of the backing. That's like, don't worry, we've got your back. Yeah, I, I think you know uh, that whole infrastructure for this sort of you know a terrorist support network, which has gone open since October seventh in a way that it really had never done before. Um, it's been enabled um, by, you know, so, as you say, people in the government. It's been enabled by some people within the Jewish community who were so desperate for the veneer of interfaith dialogue that they were willing to, you know, join forces with CARE because they saw them as, you know, an, a fellow minority group, as if they were the NAACP in the age of Dr. King, when they're quite the opposite. And, you know, it's a bad look to be demonstrating a cancer hospital. But they don't seem to care. Uh, they seem to um, just think that any Jewish, you know, target, any target that can be connected to Jews, whether it's a cancer hospital or Jewish businesses in places like Philadelphia or in Toronto or anywhere else in, in L.A., that that's somehow OK. Well, and also in mainstream media, too, when you do a story that I guess involves Islamophobia or you want to or you want to balance it. There's always like a balance of like there's a Jewish person saying X, Y, Z. They also want you to get, you know, the, the the Muslim side and they you have to call care. Care is the place in the newsroom that it's literally the Rolodex. It's in the Rolodex and you have to get a statement, whether it's a statement, a sound or something. Care says X, Y and Z. Yeah. Now, just to switch topics, a related topic, I think one of, you know, along with the disappointment of American Jews at the way that the media and even you know institutions like uh, universities have been so silent about anti-Semitism and even encouraging it has been the response of um, feminist organizations and prominent feminists to the rape of Israeli women by Hamas on October seventh, and you know in an era of Me Too when we were constantly told to believe all women, but I guess the exception was don't believe Israeli women. How has how this happened and how are these organizations getting away with it? You know, it's literally what it is. Me too, unless you're a Jew. I know you've heard that. Um, you de you delegitimize Israelis to the point that their lives don't matter. That's all I can think about because I've had a lot of time to think about this and go, why? Why isn't, you know, Alyssa Milano coming out and saying something? Why is it Michelle Obama saying something? Yeah. And it's like, you really believe that they deserved it. That's the only way you've delegitimized the Israelis to the point mm -hmm. that like their lives don't matter. It's disgusting. It's, it's unfathomable that we have come to this point where uh, rape and murders and massacres don't matter because they're Jewish. I, I I'm I'm baffled every day, like by the side. The silence is deafening. It really is, and that's why voices like myself, voices like you, are so important, especially for you know the innocent people who who don't have their voice anymore. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, so uh, let's uh, conclude. Let's wrap up by talking about whether the media, like other American institutions, which have been captured, you know, by, you know, sort of the woke, are, are they hopelessly compromised by bias and ideology? Or, you know, can legacy outlets, can the broadcast media be saved? Or do we really just need to rely on alternatives? Uh, and I guess the question is, uh, that I'm asking you is, are you optimistic about American journalism? And I guess, you know, the corollary to that, are you optimistic about America in 2024? I'm not optimistic about American journalism unless there's a like a full 180 and that would mean killing DEI, you know, going back to the basics of journalism. I don't really see that happening. I just I don't I, I, I listen. I don't expect 
a, a new journalist in a small market in let's say Bozeman, Montana, to watch the 40 minute video, right, of mm -hmm. the massacre by Hamas. But I do expect the executives to require them to watch it. They make them watch DEI harassment videos. But will that happen? I don't have any, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think that will happen. Um, like I said, it has to be, it has to be a, a 180. Am I optimistic about 2024 as a country? Yeah, I think we need change. Do I think Biden isn't going to win? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think we're, we're going to have, I, I think we're definitely going to have a change. And as long as we have that change, I think we can see things going in a different direction in our country. Cause like you said, a lot of people are starting to wake up and a lot of people are now voting on what, like, what do you call that? Like one, I like not one item, but you know what I'm saying? Like one, one, one policy. There's a litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. Like one policy. And a lot of people, when it is anti-Semitism for them, a lot of people, it's national security. It's the borders, the illegal immigration. Um, so I, I think the nation as a whole is, is fed up. And we saw what happened with the Iowa caucuses. Yeah, well, I I think um, well, we have a long way to go till November. Um, my, my great fear is that um, if it turns out the way you've just predicted it, we may have a real insurrection on our hands after that, because um, clearly uh, the way the media is covering things, the way they shut off, see the way uh, CNN and MSNBC stopped covering Trump's speech when he won Iowa because he was saying things they didn't right. like. I, I will um, see, that, uh, that speaks I'm volumes not, yeah. about the way coverage of this election is going to go. Well, the coverage of the election, yes. I, I, I'm talking in terms of do I believe in the person who might be in power? Yes. But is what would we have? The, yes, 100 percent. They're, they're already trying to frame him as a Nazi. I mean, I, I'm sure you've heard that. It is going to be um, a roller coaster. And I've said this on my social media. I've said this on air. We need to all buckle up because I, I, I think they're not going to fairly cover uh, the GOP part of the side, whether it's Trump, whether, you know, whoever it is, but especially because they hate Trump so much, it, it's it's going to be very ugly and it's going to be nasty. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a given. Yeah. Um, S Stella, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, you can see Stella on OAN TV. Follow her on X at, at Stella Esco TV and on Instagram at Stella Inger Escobedo. We also want to thank our audience. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.